So that's me, 25 years in construction. It's quite hard to believe you're a quarter of a century. I started off in Scotland as a young site engineer sort of thing. I wasn't very good at it, so it wasn't so long before I was in the office playing about with technology within there. And I've been lucky enough to see many, many change programs. My background actually is as contractor, you know, and then engineer. I got interested in asset management, and then this thing for me came along, not called BIM, but virtual design construct. And I got really interested, probably actually how it made cultural change more than anything within there, how it actually could affect better collaboration. And I was lucky enough back in 2011 to be part uh, head of BIM implementation at the UK government's BIM program. We've been doing a lot of work across there, sort of thing. So, and that continues onwards as well. So I look forward to telling our story in terms of what we're doing. You're probably wondering why there's a Mars bar and a bus bar up there. You know, I come from, talk about MEP in building services. You know, my granddad, who was also David Felt, was a, a plumber. My dad's a high voltage engineer. I told my dad, I said, I'm coming across this area to talk to guys in the world of building services and wider. He goes, son, he goes, did you not mean me? He goes, you don't know the difference between a Mars bar and a bus bar, so. Uh, <laughs> And he's probably right, and that's probably my best joke for today. So, uh, so it's good to be here. So I, I come from Scotland. So you know, you're thinking, how many folk here have been to Scotland? Wow, excellent. So hopefully, between Liam yesterday and today, you're probably starting to get a tune for the language. But uh, if I do speak a bit fast, I do have Chris down at the bottom to tell me to slow down sort of thing. So hopefully, within a couple of minutes, you get used to the cadence. So this is my home time, Stirling, within there. So why Scotland relevant? Well, actually, you know, being here in Victoria, you can see, you know, there's our population, just under six million. And it's interesting, you know, you come to Victoria as well, you know, we're about the same in terms of population. And actually in Scotland, we've been a real journey as well towards BIM. And I think it's something we've done very rapidly. ECOM has been a big part of it. I have the honor of chairing uh, our Scottish BIM delivery group there. And you can see one of the first things we've done in Scotland, you know, we're relatively the same in terms of your state, is actually put in policy, trying to make sure we can create a lever to try and build momentum for BIM within there as well. You can see on the right-hand side, we've also created a navigator. And I think one of the things is we equate all these things, be it standards, guidance now, but actually trying to navigate it can be a challenge as well. But it's still say we've done that in 18 months, our program within there. And just to try and say, one of the key things we're trying to say is actually appropriateness. Sometimes I think no BIM is better than BIM just for the sake of doing BIM. It's been very much in Scotland thinking about purpose-driven and actually, you know, different levels of BIM maturity within there as well. This bit on the right-hand side, your BIM navigator is actually completely open, so please have a look at it. You see a couple of things. There's a grading tool that helps you actually determine an appropriate level of BIM for your project. And this is a great thing, you know, a ton of investment to help you set your BIM goals and actually look in terms of the quantum you can do for your targets within there as well. Just a quick video, you can see there the navigator. If you just go into Google and put SFT BIM portal, you get into it. So free and open. You can see there you can come in, you worked out your level, who am I in terms of a government department within there. And the idea is it starts to take people through the complete life cycle, all the different stages, and all the tasks that you've got to start to think about as well. So please, there's a huge amount of content. See, it's a gift from Scotland that you can go and play about with as well, and I'll hopefully help your journey plan as well in terms of what you're doing. But as said, I work for this company called AECOM. Uh, hopefully, Many have heard it. We've got offices, obviously, throughout the world, and indeed, in terms of uh, here in Melbourne as well. You can see we're a relatively big company. You, we offer that, you know, multidisciplinary services over 150 companies, and margin now in approximately 18.2 billion. Well, what does that mean from a big data perspective? I think fair to say that we're quite unique. You know, we've got real opportunities to explore explore big data. In terms of BIM, we've got 20,000 BIM practitioners across the world working around six languages. So moving huge amounts of data across every day. And actually we've got 30,000 people that are actually collaborating every day on cloud-based services, moving all that information about, information that's following the sun, if you like. And we're starting to think really in terms of how do we start to leverage that as well, because it's a big opportunity. It represents billions of dollars in construction and operation as well. We are quite unique. You think about, you know, an ACOM in terms of what we do. You know, that's our, if you like, our circle of life. You know, we use this term pursuit. Actually, a big part we do is we start to think about BIM and data right from the earliest seeds of actually thinking about investment. You know, we start to think about how BIM affects our, our PMO, our program management office, plug it into design, finance, build and operate. And obviously we do it across different ways as well, be it buildings, be it bridges, road networks as well. 
One of the things we're trying to do, you can imagine we're trying to move information across here. We use these 12, if you like, stages of our data journey to try and articulate it. Because imagine, we call these our eras, you know, eras of, if you like, of data moving right across there. But one of the things we want to try and imagine is flowing. So one of the key things for us is to move right around. We call it cradle to cradle, that continuous circle of data is actually trying to make it frictionless. So we're not thinking about data purely for an area such as design, but actually how does it move into procurement? How does it move into operation as well? And we want to make sure there's real governance about it. So data continuity and trying to make it frictionless is hugely important for us. So we're not just thinking about the modeling, but more and more, if you like, thinking about how we move data across that whole life cycle within there. And you'll probably think, God, another speaker from the UK is going to talk about UK BIM. So Hopefully some of the stuff today will resonate and it won't end up within the pool room as well. As you can tell I'm a huge fan of the castle as well, but, uh, <laughs> within there. but here's a question. I think, you know, we're quite good at coming to the UK and telling you all these things here. So, but here's a quote from the UK, you know, one of the things, we need to improve efficiency, key words of the construction sector, better procurement, probably more collaborative, and start to think about earlier contractor engagement. And we had a speaker dinner uh, the other night and it was incredible that that need to involve our supply chain much earlier when the process came up within there. Anybody want to have a stab? When do you think that quote came out from the UK? I know these are all a bit shy. Anybody want to have it? Or I'll start to pick names. 2010. 2010, yep. A higher or lower? 92, yep, just a bit lower. 1944, it came out in a government report, the Simons Report. Do you, think, you look at it today, we're thinking about exactly the same things, aren't we? We talk about reform. We talk about the need for better collaboration. And you can see that image back there in 1944, you know, heading towards the end of the war. We were thinking about off-site back then as well. So key question, you know, why have these things never happened? We've had umpteen government reports in the UK. You think, you know, things haven't changed as fast as they should. And I think one of the big things is we often think about technology change. You look at sustainability, you look at safety, you think actually, why have they been so successful? And I think one of the big things, you look at that advert, would that be acceptable today? Because I think it's about values and collaboration. Well, maybe the Donald Trump joke uh, within there, but we've got to really think about not just our technology, not just the picks and clicks, but actually thinking about the business plan and actually thinking about value within there as well. And I think that's a big part. We've got to think more and more round about that. We had a good discussion over dinner the other night in terms of actually how do we get better innovation within our construction. And actually, a big part of it comes down to our clients. And I think we're probably all within the room still. How many clients do we have in the room today? One, two. I would say you're all clients. I think that's a big thing. I think we've all got to take that mentality. No matter where we are in the supply chain, we're maybe stepping information requirements down the way or up the way. And we've got to think about that. And these are the things that came out from our dinner within there. Clients need to understand their, their role as leaders in the construction technology. We've got to move away from transactional constructions as well to think about more and more about opportunities through the whole life cycle. And actually within our contracts, encourage active innovation within there as well. And I think the big thing we're seeing is actually the clients have got a real role in encouraging the right environment for BIM and technologies to happen within there as well. And a lot of that comes down, I think, to the form of contract. Clients are thinking about data richness, actually how they use their data within there. And actually clients and supply chain investing in research as well within there. And we're starting to see this actually moving away from output to clients becoming more outcome focused. We're thinking about forms of contract around about servitization within there as well. And starting to think about these supply chain alliances, one of the things we talked about over dinner was, well, innovation's a problem because we assemble supply chains for such a short period. Actually, over a longer term alliance, a much more opportunity to drive the technologies and drive innovation. Start to think about emotional intelligence as well within there, actually, the social science and behaviors but still maintain a competitive tension within there as well. Hugely important, need for agility. And I think the big thing, we mentioned that already, BIM should have queer purpose. When we create data, it should have a queer use case behind it within there. One of the things we have done in the UK is we had a lot of work in terms of the client upskilling piece. And I think it's still a key, key part as we encourage all these different parts. So probably not there yet, but we can start to think about all these constructs that are needed. I think this is a big part in terms of shift in thinking we're seeing, actually thinking about the client that becomes good at buying their data first. So they've got that digital, we, we often use this term digital twin, but actually client that's thinking about buying the information that clearly sets out requirements to supply chain, building the physical asset. And I think the big challenge for the clients then is thereafter, once we get into operation, you're thinking about 
something like a high-speed rail, 150 years of data curation as well within there. So trying to maintain that model is, is a massive task that we've got to think about as well within there. One of the big things I'd say in terms of the UK, I think it's been a real success, is actually clients becoming good at clearly articulating information requirements. Information, again, we use this term clear purpose. We set these out in terms of what we call a plain language question. Plain language question, you know, can we actually afford the design? Does it meet with our carbon requirements within there? When? Who are the actors that are going to supply it? And actually clear in terms of what we call level of definition as well. You can see the journey we go through within there. We set out initially in this document called employer's information requirement. And again, we're starting to see this, I think, appearing more and more in Australia as well. You can see the journey within there. We start off with an information delivery plan set out by the client. What information do I want? The supply chain responds. There's a dialogue that goes on. And actually, it comes part of the contract through a master information delivery plan and a protocol as well. And one of the things we've got better, I think, at trying to articulate is this thing called Kobe as a data deliverable within there as well. Unfortunately, I think, uh, the discussion with my colleagues yesterday, you know, have we actually managed to communicate our data exchanges and the likes of Kobe well enough? And I think it's fair to say it's probably been a bit too technical. I think people have actually seen it as an Excel spreadsheet rather than a schema and a database as well within there. But it's been our, our choice tool within the UK. And you know what? I think, if anything, it's helped clients become much more data centric within there, but really thinking about taking that time at the beginning of a project to set it out. So standards in the UK have been hugely useful. It's made consistency within our supply chain. Everybody getting access to the same high quality data. And within November of this year, I think one of the good things is that word harmonization. There's going to be international standards coming out for BIM. So in November, we'll see the publication of the first two parts of it, ISO 19650, part one and two. So part one looks at the general principles of information management. And part two looks at how we'll exchange information in a BIM context during the CAPEX stages. So across, and I think that's a good thing. And I think the intention is within uh, Australia to look at how it connects with your other relevant uh, BIM standards here again. And it goes further than that as well. 2020, we build upon it. And two of the UK standards will come the backbone. Part three, you look at operation phases of our assets using uh, BIM. And this one, I think, is hugely important. Part five, it will look at security. So we'll start to see an international wrapper growing around BIM. And I think it's a great thing that no matter what part of the world you're in, there'll be consistency of approach within there as well. And the big part we say is this thing called BIM. You know, I think we've got to start thinking it as a destination. We've reached it and we finish it. It's becoming, I think, a real journey. We think about BIM as a, a level one. That's our foundation block. It's so important. We think about the concepts of common data environments. And we think about principles of information management. We move on to this thing called BIM Level 2. I'm sure it should have been a dollar there. But we think more about our capital data, our operational for FM. And we call that total expenditure data. And I think that's as far as we can get just now. And then we're starting to think about what's next. The next construct in terms of another two data sets, operational and performance coming in through telemetry and sensors. We've got another step after that. Thinking about social outcomes. Why did we all start construction? I think the big part of it was actually we wanted to make better benefits to society. And we've got to remember that should be our key purpose, our North Star, in terms of what we're doing. How do you use our data? How do you use our modeling to actually affect that as well in terms of what we're doing? Part of our discussion, it's been interesting to see with Australia. What I'm seeing is, you know what? You guys are really getting good at design models. I think any of your big projects here have got very mature models from the design stages within there as well. Are we seeing it from construction? I think it's starting to get there now in terms of more VDC, starting to build cost models within there, time simulations within there as well. And at the same time, in terms of, you know, often referred to as a 60-year asset model, I think we're starting to get more and more of that bi-directional link between our computer-assisted facilities models, product data sheets, and the geometrical model as well. But that's going to take time, you know, as models through from capital stages within there as well. However, one of the things, and I think this is global, we need to go back to is not think about a forward plan, but at the same time think about all these other things about information management. Clients have got a huge existing estate they need to think about building, make it index and searchable, think about metadata as well. So go forward, but at the same time, let's think about going back and getting all these good principles of information management and security embedded in as well. There's a word I keep hearing in Australia as well, sort of thing, and it's probably quite unique to you guys as well, this concept of digital engineering. 
And it's, it's probably it's hard to define, but I've, I've seen three things within there. I've seen the construct of BIM, virtual design construct, getting people round about the model, empowering them, and our geospatial data sets as well. And I think what I'm seeing, that's kind of a linear journey, isn't it? You start to build all these constructs. But actually, in terms of think about your own strategy, where next, we hear these terms in the, say, 4.0, we talk about at dinner, society, this world of the smart factory within there, the real-time cyber connection. And actually think from a social point of view, how do you use all this data as well? And I think it's actually less obvious. So as you think about your own strategy, think about all these themes that are going to come together after digital engineering, how they juxtapose together as well within there. What I would say is give some thought to your journey plan. This is one of the departments within the UK. I think it's really good. You know, they're really trying to articulate their journey. You can see there these two wedges from BIM to transitioning to digital engineering. And I think the first thing, it's very much phased in terms of a journey plan. I don't know it's, it's working there. Trying to put in a series of components over several years. Starting to think about moving from document to models to data centric to an integrated geospatial data sets within there. But a long term plan with key milestones within there and actually looking at the benefits they want to put with well. So I say anything you come away today, think about that longer term plan in terms of how you transition as well within there. At the same time, I think BIM is having a bit of a, an image problem just now. No one wants to talk about doing BIM. Everybody talks about big digital transformations now. And actually, one of the things I'm seeing, you know, BIM doesn't give a silver bullet. It's all these little incremental saving. It's like, you know, the Sky Racing team, you know, it's about the smarter bike, it's about the diet. So all these things coming together. And I think actually we need to make sure we get this foundation in terms of BIM. And I think that's the thing we've got to realize, you know, there's a long tail. I think we've got quite good in terms of industry adoption for designers, but actually we've got all our product manufacturers, we've got all our operators as well. I think construction takes time. You look at that picture back in the 1800s of construction, look to now. Not much difference, is there? You know, we've got better at PPE, we've got better at safety within there, but actually how do we inform that change? It does take time within there. I think it takes time and it takes attention span. I think what we find is you go on a program sort of thing, you get your first deadline, say, you know what, we can get those CAD files, say, yeah, that's okay, let's just do it. The minute you pull that lever, that's when it all goes wrong. So it needs a tension span within there as well, which is hugely important. So big question, you know, I think this is probably where we are within there. It's a, it's a quote from Churchill, I really like it. You know, now it's not the end, it's not even the beginning of the end, but it's perhaps in terms of BIM, it's the end of the beginning. We're still on that journey within there as well. We've been lucky within the UK, you know, we've had that lever of government helping us move the dial within there. We had a mandate that came out as part of government construction strategy. We then had a longer term vision, a strategic plan, we call it Digital Built Britain within there. And we had money as well within our budget to keep moving that lever and government trying to help make that convergence within there. At the same time, you can see the messages from our key institutions moving towards this industrial revolution or industry 4.0 blurring that line between digital, by even biological, this age of discovery, that's for Institute of Civil Engineering. You know, as we grow in terms of BIM, other constructs in terms of intelligent buildings, AI, all coming into it as well. So it's starting to shape a convergence. And I think one of the big things we're seeing within ACOM is actually, this thing called BIM was maybe a bit of a Trojan horse, and I think it ties in very much with the theme of today's one as well, is actually how do we make better innovation happen? It lets us test within there, and it lets us move if you like, think about the different ways we can do things within there. So we're moving, I think, towards that world of whole sector digitization within there. BIM, if you like, probably go back probably about five years coming across here, maybe BIM information management was a bit niche, but it's starting to come that central plank within there. And we're starting to see convergence for all these other things as well now. You know, geospatial, mobile services, city service, they've all been going for years, different origin points, but they're all starting to converge together. I think over the coming years, we'll start to see actually how it can enable that better use of our new infrastructure and the infrastructure we've got already. You see they're moving away from the individual model to start to think about how do all these things converge together, especially at a city level as well within there. So convergent and combinational in terms of what we're doing. At the same time, we're seeing assets, I think they're once dumb, disconnected, are becoming much more intelligent as well now in terms of sensors, but actually creating huge amounts of data sets. And we're having to think much, much more about data security within there. Think about the value of your data security as well. It's got huge commercial worth within there. But not just buildings, there's actually a lot more smart infrastructure 
as well. Now, how do we build it faster, smarter, and get better outcomes? Well, a lot of the people are going to build it are going to be the next generation of engineers as well. So actually, what does that look like? We use this term skills 2030. You know, what is their future generation like? How are they going to use technologies to transform lives if they're there? You know, how do they collaborate better? How do they communicate? Probably quite different to ourselves as well. And what we're seeing that the role of the engineers got to evolve more and more. And we think about that T-shaped leader. You know, that's what we're trying to think. That actually understands the knowledge of the whole life cycle better. They're not going to be experts in every part of it, but they can understand how data moves right the way through there and actually has got depth of discipline skills within there. It might be in terms of algorithms or data science within there. It might be design, but folk have started to get much more understanding of that whole life cycle process as well. And that's what we're trying to create and adapt within there as well. What we're seeing as well as a move is towards being socially responsive assets as well. Well, you know, what does that really mean? I think IoT is going to be a big enabler there. We're starting to be able to communicate with our objects in real time within there and our buildings and start to understand how people use our assets as well. So user assets, big thing. And that means new players within there. So I think people from a social sciences background as well coming in. That's maybe looking at actually how people use assets. The client journey. Imagine a patient coming in through a hospital and starting to help shape them through that journey and understand how we use things as well. We're also seeing about interconnectedness. We've got to think about, if you like, the standards and about sensors, but also as well how it converges with other things such as material sciences. We're thinking actually, how do we measure stresses on a beam or a column? How do we start to embed sensors within there that's going to provide us with that data? 5G is going to be a big, big part, so starting to think about the needs for all these infrastructure within there as well. And I think one of the things we've got to do more and more is to start to think about measuring performance, be a city level or a building. I think as an industry, we've often struggled to actually measure how things actually work within there. At the same time, we've got challenges within data as well. We're creating huge amounts of it. How do we manage it? How do we manage it securely within there as well? One of the things that we saw within Ecom is actually it was becoming a burden to our clients. Our clients were struggling with huge amounts of data. So we created what we call our free eyes within there. I could buy Ecom and it looks at information management. How do we start to manage all this information for our clients? The second eye is an integration. How do we help integrate all these different things together, from, especially from legacy <laughs> systems. And lastly, how do we get intelligence from it? And that's starting to think about the data analytics, the simulation, and starting to look at all these different constructs, because huge portfolios, how do you translate that into intelligence within there? Think about sensory networks, predictive analytics, and dashboarding reporting. So I think that's a common now. How do we help clients unlock value from their data? Huge amounts of data coming in from everything, be it smart plant, BMS within there, but actually what we're seeing is we witness that, you know, built environment organizations struggling to actually get value from their data within there. We're helping them translate it within there, giving it true use within there as well. So what we're finding, I think this is common now, we're converging to that data science uh, point of view as well within there, which is really key. Well, why do it? You can see some of the things down the left. I think they're common in Australia as well. Productivity challenges within construction, probably number one within there. Design quality, actually getting things that are going to last a lifetime within there. Cyclical nature is the sector, and I think one of the things we talked about at the dinner that night, skill shortage, well, really key. But we're seeing three macro themes that are starting to converge now. So I think about how construction comes of high value manufacture. Construction moving in the digital economy, you think about it, we're probably the last industry that still works rather analog in terms of transactions and new forms of contracts. So convergence of three themes they're thinking about being more outcome-based than anything. And I think the big thing we've got to focus on is actually not thinking about, if you like, the whole design construct, but also focus on actually service provision. That's what we're doing, isn't it? It's not just giving a product, but actually, does it give the outcome that it should do as well? The term we use in the UK, and I think it's been hugely successful, we brought it together with BIM soft landings. Thinking about that customer experience, building in right at the beginning and measuring it, what we call post-occupancy evaluation and using the model to test the maintainability and operation of it as well within there. So free wise, there's some good reports out there. It's a really good one, modernize or die, looked at low productivity within there, fragmented leadership. I'm sure you've seen the one, uh, the usual ones in terms of McKinsey, in terms of the need for better productivity, design for manufacturing assembly. And the one that writes the government in the UK is long term. You can see some of the, the savings, 33% in cost that's over a whole life, so not thinking about CapEx, but savings over a whole life of a project. 50% reduction in delivery. 
of time. Well, how do you do that? It's not just one thing. It's thinking about smart procurement, automation of procurement. It's starting to think about DFME, all these bits coming together to make these savings as well. And here's our, probably our biggest challenge within there. This world of productivity. So you can see there, I'm getting the button onto it, our whole economy, whoops. I'm going to lose it. You can see there in terms of our whole economy, which is the blue one. Construction, if you like, our GDP is about 7% within there. And you can see there where construction, the red line tracks well below our productivity as a whole. And you can see there up in top grey, manufacturing. It's got much more better productivity. So actually the problem we've got, if we don't get construction right, it can actually put a break in our whole economy within there as well. So how come manufacturers way up there? If we can close the gap on it, that blue line there, you see there's a huge opportunity for us within there. So construction moving towards more of advanced manufacturing within there as well. At the same time, it's not just about BIM and new project investments. You can see all these orange boxes. They represent the value of existing assets. So we've done a, if like an exercise in the UK. It was estimated the addition of new assets actually gives less than 0.5 each year of, it to, of value compared to existing infrastructure. So not just thinking about how do we do more going forward, more for less, but actually how do we do more with what we've got as well. So we're seeing a big focus in another year is actually looking at existing portfolio as well going forward. Well, how do you do that? We're thinking about, if you like, digital techniques in terms of whole life, cross-sector approaches, whole life performance, and actually learning these data feedback loops as well, moving to manufacturing, and trying to exploit all the commercial competitive that's offered as well within there. And this is how we're seeing that flow of information going, if you like. We're, I think BIM has been a faithful friend for us. It's helping BIM, VDC, through the design and construct, probably worth about 20% of that total cost. We're now moving into computer assisted facilities management systems, asset management, giving us huge value during that operational life cycle as well within there. You can see 2080, we've got to focus more and more in data and how we can exploit it during that stage as well. But this is the next part. Actually, how do we, during the asset information model, think about how we can affect profit and loss, be it a hotel, be it a hospital within there, and think more and more about portfolio operation modeling as well. And then finally, there's the big part. If we can start to get social outcomes, it might be a hospital that performs better, better patient recovery time, that's when we get the real benefits. And this is where we get the big part. If we start to think about real-time post-occupancy evaluation through sensors, analytics, learning, and think about shaping demand and prioritization. And these are some of the constructs that we're seeing at ACOM going forward. You know, BIM has helped us with digital prototyping. It's helping us through better these initial stages. We start to understand better asset and health monitoring, again, through sensors. And we're moving to these two constructs on the right-hand side. We're early days of cognitive condition management with there, predictive analytics, data vi visualization, trying to think about repair before fail, and then moving on to that world of digital enterprise asset management, thinking about optimization of all our operational activities as well. And again, it's a journey putting all these things <coughs> together, and I think BIM is our bedrock within there as well. We probably all often overuse this term as well, digital twin, but actually one of the big things in the UK, we're now moving towards a national digital twin. It was set out within an, uh, with our National Infrastructure Commission report. I think it's a huge aspiration within there, but we're on that journey, a real-time model, you imagine, of all our infrastructure within the UK. It will allow us to do it securely. It will allow us to move information right the way through all these sectors, be it weather, power, rail, to actually make smart decisions in terms of forward planning, energy consumption, and start to think about resilience with our infrastructure as well. And improve, I think, the big part, the social outcome. Massive plan within there. And the big part, from a data point of view, it means we need to think about a new data framework that's going to work cross-sector as well. Big opportunity. We've done a program in the UK, it's called Digital Built Britain. We have a Centre for Digital Built Britain run at Cambridge University, partnership with government to help build this as well. So you can see the big part within there, probably the third one down, information across the whole life that's going to give whole life value and optimise services. So government funding that longer term journey towards that national digital twin as well. And this is what the architecture looks like for it. So you see down the bottom, BIM, big part of it. But the bit up from it is actually how do we build an information management landscape that's going to allow data to actually transfer across sectors, be it energy, transportation, or the built environment. And you can see some of the constructs across there, from smart contracts to exploiting AI. And you can see on the right-hand side, you know, a national digital twin is not 
one big thing. It's an aggregate of all these ones. Might be in terms of a digital twin for health services, a roads network. You start to bring them all together, but a longer term journey to digitise what we're doing. And why is it important? Well, this is up in Scotland. It happened a couple of years ago now. PFI project, Oxgang School in Edinburgh, wall collapses. Well, what's the, the big part of it? You know, government was out to try and find was that same subcontractor used in any other one? Was that same detail used? We can't find it. So what happens then? All the other schools in the portfolio get closed down as well for intrusive surveys. Same time, we've had tragedies in London as well. You know, and people can't find information when we try and find out did any other high-rise buildings have that same specification of cladding on it. So we've got to start thinking about this concept of digital twin in reality because our built environment should be seen actually as an information-based industry to allow better decisions and actually be able to base decisions on reliable information. Across portfolios, it should be axiomatic that we can actually search and find the information we need. So we think a digital twin is hugely important. So what does that look like? Well, right at a baseline level for us, it's about, we call it an AMCD, somewhere to store all your asset model in terms of smart digital documents, our CAD files, our BIM, and our COBE as well. That's our baseline within there. We start to then to link it with other systems in terms of asset registry. We're thinking about putting data into a CAPM system in geospatial. And then we start to think about the next part, the live data feeds, and we're starting to get there now. How do we link the model up to BIM, geospatial, telemetry, and then finally linking up to other enterprise systems such as the ERP, and that's a real journey. We're working with clients just now to try and build that ecosystem, and that's generally what it looks like. You know, we're seeing that not everybody's got everything there yet, and we start to build it up over years for new project investments and such like within there as well, but it starts to fill in, but you've got to start to build that roadmap and journey just now. Key one for us, though, and this is the real bedrock, just trying to get all these drawings and everything digitized, indexable and searchable as well. How do we translate from the typical asset management cupboard to a more digital environment? Good quality product technical data sheets within there that we can actually find. So indexing and searching information is key within there. So one of the things we're finding at a real practical level is getting ontologies and classification systems right as well for all our information. Good quality metadata, and I think BIM gives us a scaffold for it. But we've got to take a bit of time to give it context and give it ownership as well. So a lot of folk have visited Edinburgh, so I think a good example. In the UK, we're using Uniclass. That's our preferred choice in terms of classification systems. So if you take Edinburgh, Edinburgh Castle as an asset, it's actually part of a complex. You can see there the schema for, uh, for Uniclass up there. We've got complexes, so you can see that red line. Edinburgh Castle is a complex, a historical site within there. It's got all these entities within there. You can see the entities are green buildings within there. We then come down to spaces and locations. So you can see some out there, outdoor music performance and such like. And then we actually carry out activities in it. We've got our military tattoo just now. So you can imagine we've got changing air, we've got makeup activities. So we can start to give context to that whole site within there as well. We can drill right down into our buildings within there and we can get it right down into a product level. We can also do the same for infrastructure as well. So for us, Uniclass is something that works for both buildings and linear as well. You can start to see it comes a great way to measure things. We can actually visualize activities or complexes within there, which comes great for measurement and actually comes great for creating your kits of parts from DFME. I think some of you may have seen this yesterday in terms of this is work in Crossrail. So they're drilling right down, you can see there an asset level, all different complexes, entities and spaces within there for the tunnels. And coming right down, if you like, to a product level within there, right down to that component for the actually that acoustic liner panel for the tunnel. And probably the big part we're now starting to think about is this part here, thinking linking up to the product data definitions and data dictionaries as well. So actually working with manufacturers and trying to standardize your product data templates, big, big thing as well. So we're finding classification hugely important and link it up to our product data templates as well. Being able to break it down to this level as well, where you've got all the information that's gonna support long-term maintenance as well within there. And that takes a bit of work, but it's hugely valuable. And I think going forward, you're going to start to see manufacturers getting picked, if you like, on operation and performance data sets as well. Our next big part is integration. You know, how do you integrate all these different systems together? We're using you know, huge amounts of tools for it uh, to try and pull it together. But we're trying to collect and unify data. We're trying to integrate databases with their looking at current state, 
but trying to build, if you like, through analytics and queries, get some real intelligence from it as well. And this is where finding the ecosystem starts to look like from a technology point of view. The big part is a common data environment, you know, somewhere to store information during your project and during operation as well within there. Linking it up through the asset information model, how it links into likes of Maximo and other 6D tools from there. And probably the bit we're all working on now is actually how do you link it up to all these other different sensory components as well. So we're starting to work more and more with those, if you like, in the services sector that are maybe helping us to link to, especially systems such as SCADA as well. But you start to bring this all together. We see a series of about eight technology pillars that are all starting to come together to help us do more for less and more with what we've got. We'll quickly go through some of the key ones as well. Our faithful friends, we talked about this concept of digital engineering, BIM, DDC and Geospatial, really helping us within there. And I think if anything, we're finding BIM is helping us with storytelling. It's helping us bring people around about the model to make smarter, much more earlier decisions there. So for us, it's as much as anything, a clear communications tool, as well as being a rich source of data. Our models are getting bigger and bigger as well. This is a project we're doing just now in Kuwait, our international airport. You can see there are over 300 models. And we've got over 300 models. The big, big part is thinking about QA and QC or model controls as well. We're thinking as well as multidisciplinary teams. Again, design teams following the sun, using a common data environment to move design around about the world within there. It's actually led by our Spanish team. You know, over, over 25 million objects are managing in that project. It's absolutely massive. And again, a big clash with, you know, clash detection matrix within there. So we're starting to manage more projects. And again, it's about the sharing of information, the sharing of models across the globe. We mentioned QA, QC becoming a big part of that process as well. Being able to take our models, being able to put them into scripting. So rule-based checking more and more. We're starting to formulate them for aviation, for healthcare within there. The data management checks, so validation and verification within there, both models and the data. And finally, being able to get some degree of representation that's understandable through dashboards and reporting as well. We've also started to move on to the next generation of this, and we call it design anomaly detection, where an ACOM office can upload their model onto the cloud within there. And the idea then is uh, when it goes into, you can see our machine learning design anomaly check. It does a pre-processing using machine learning, and it pops out, if you like, a BIM collaboration file that then goes back to the team for their review as well. So starting to use basic principles of machine learnings for this model review process. I think one of the key themes that have came out as well probably over the last day and a bit has been this world, if you like, of data-driven infrastructure, the parametric objects is there. I think it was Liam you mentioned this yesterday in terms of Highways England, where some clients are thinking about their objects, and not just in terms of the physical ones, but as well, but starting to think about the plant that's used as well for maintaining it to make well-informed decisions, not just in terms of the construction cycle, but actually thinking more and more about the operation as well gets people around about the table. So I start to think about the rules that are going to place these objects as well within there and actually dictate their placement as well. So clients now start to think about kits of parts and wrapping modeling principles using parametric scripting. I think that's a big challenge up at the top is actually trying to work out the processing and the flows and we need people with real understanding of that process as well to help get that in. This is some of the savings we're making at ACOM. You can see this project there was a structure, a structural team Big challenge in terms of curb beams. So you can see there in terms of the modeling, moving from 30 days traditionally down to two days using scripting, and these slanted columns in terms of the modeling from three weeks to one hour. So big, big savings of there, and actually automating some of the design review processes. So, so big savings moving to more, if you like, these scripted data-driven savings. In terms of plant room, we're starting to think about configuration, putting in the raw data and starting to build, you know, chiller plant coming up. So data-driven design especially some of our modulars for risers as well. So <coughs> starting to bring this together, all these schemes in terms of collaboration, building things together, and automation. Big thing we're starting to get out of our models as well is data analytics, trying to make sense of them as well. Better project management as well as design optimization. I'm sure if you go out and have a look, you'll see the tools like, such as Revitio that are helping our project managers understand the tasks and actually being able to look at the key issues was there. The one on the right-hand side is one of our own in-house tools as well. So we're thinking more about actually our own creation of our own tools and apps that are going to help us understand some of the key issues around about it as well. So and I think that's the big thing. We've got to make it usable. We need to make our project managers that be able to use the tools as well. So simplification, apps really helping 
of that process. And I think one of the big things in terms of understanding the storytelling piece around about it is starting to think about immersive techniques as well. You can see some of the tools that we're using in terms of both AR and VR within it. We're starting to build teams, and that's a big part, helping build the story. We're starting to see it come out in sight. This is from Crossrail in the UK. This is a test of actually for facilities management using the Daiquiri helmets within there. So giving people the view, it might be a construction manager in terms of actually understanding when you're hitting a reduced level, the safety zones within there. Being able to use it for facilities managers to actually find out the whole life cycle data or operational data. We're using it as well to inform some complex design. This is work that we've done on the Serpentine Gallery in London within there. Really complex, linking the AR, VR, if you like, to that world of parametric modeling as well within there. And this one is one we're doing just now. We're, in, we're just finishing in Cameroon. It's 50,000 uh, stadium. Real fast track program. So we're using all these techniques to help inform the construction sequence. And I think, again, we come to that ex user experience. So you can imagine, you can come into the model, you can actually go to your seat within there, look at the view. You can actually even hear the acoustics on it as well. Or even from you know, the, the player's point, if you actually come in and understand what it looks like if you're going to be taking if you like a goal there. Not that Scotland ever be at a World Cup, but apart from that, actually, it looks like that. Uh, so we're starting to use this for much rich narrative and storytelling around about there. Probably one of the biggest things, so for those that were there last year, with Jamie Donson talking about, from Brighton Wood, talking about its convergence with design for manufacture and assembly. And we're starting to see people, especially contractors, putting their hand in the pocket. This is a laying a rook one. I think while we can have DFMA without BIM, we're seeing a mutualism between the two of them coming together in terms of safety, quality, and cost. This is actually up in Scotland. Scotland's got, if you like, lots of innovation centres that are now being funded. This is a Construction Scotland innovation. You can see that's one of our robots that we're actually using now to concept things. And government's thinking about actually, we need to have a common approach and DFMA being a big, big part of that journey plan. How do you start to use all these advanced techniques within there? That's that same robot over in China now, be actually being deployed onto a site as well, starting to construct forms as well. So we are seeing much, much more of how or robotics can actually work with construction as well within there. But we've always had an inherent problem. We've never had the pipeline for all these. You know, you see that up there. There's a typical single program. It's pretty lumpy, that sinusoidal wave. There's no demand to actually create there. But what we looked at in the UK, what if you aggregate all your programs together? Well, actually, you create a pipeline that allow design for manufacture. And we created, if you go onto the Centre for Digital Built Britain website, you'll see this great report by Bryden Wood that's actually looking how we bridge the gap, how we build. And that's about clients that are thinking about buying spaces instead of assets because there's a great reusability. So you see that little diagram there? What it done, we've done a study to actually look at common grid sizes and common components. So we actually find out, be it a prison, be it a healthcare, what's the standard grid sizes that are the same, what's the standard components. So you can actually see the opportunity. We work out our common components and products. We start to think about designs that are going to allow if you like, standard manufacturing processes, and they create a sub-assembly. So we're using BIM to try and inform it. We work out our interfaces, and we come up with common kits of parts that actually work across departments as well. And that starts to build the pipeline that allow design for manufacture. Some great work, if you want to Cambridge, the CDB website, Centre for Digital Built Britain, you can download all these key parts as well. And this is some of the concepts that we're doing the testing on it just now. Number one, you can see the simplicity, thinking about logistics as well how we put it using simple color coding. So it can actually descale some of the processes. Now you can see the simplicity of pulling it together, smart logistics, and starting to think about more manufacture. And from a model point of view, that means we're having to think about models that are actually be suitable for going straight to a manufacture process. We're doing this with an ACOM. This is our healthcare one. We call it Studio H. We were trying to think about creating better products that are going to help the healthcare environment. You can see there, not just doing it in the model, but building the physical prototypes there of the prefabricated operating room from the model. And you can see some of the savings we're making, especially in the world of building services. Building the digital twin, testing it in terms of a real environment within there, and working with the, the health team. Massive savings in terms of the prefabrication within there as well, both in terms of cost, time, I think most importantly, quality as well. And we get this right, well, we can start to think about moving. We talk about the ACOM, our cycle at the beginning as well. We start to think about that information moving right the way through, effective collaboration in terms of how do you do more for the same? Well, we're going through the CAPEX, we're starting to move it into OPEX, but we're now thinking about, especially with DMA, how do you optimize service output? How do we use this data to shape demand as well? 
And that's going to help us in terms of strategic forward planning. And that's going to be a big key, I'm sure, for you and for your clients as well. So we're starting to think more and more about how we shift data right through a complete end-to-end -end process. And that's a big challenge for us. And this is what it kind of looks like. This is from our Digital Built Britain in the UK. I think we've got good at shifting our data from the early stages from design into construct. And then we're starting to move it now and maintain. But you see the journey of actually moving to the service providers. How do they start to use the data? And actually, how do our citizens start to use it as well? But here's the important part. How do we feed it back? How do we understand in terms of, is it doing what it should? You know, how is the evaluation in terms of performance? So our goal is to create real-time post-occupancy evaluation, learn from it in terms of systematic learning, and actually turn it into smart, forward investment decisions. And actually, we talked about our GDP of about, what, 7% through that part. Actually, if you start to think about service provision, what we do in the built environment probably shapes around about 40, 50% of our GDP when you start to think about that service provision as well. You can see it's the same model, but laid out. So you start to see the value proposition. If we start to think about informing better design, good. Same with operate, it's even bigger. But if you start to think about enhancing through our data, operational performance and social performance. So imagine you can think about a hospital that's got one day better patient recovery, because you know that actually having more glass affects that. If it might be a case of actually through telemetry, if you've got an outbreak in terms of something like Legionnaires, you know who that patient's been in contact with. That will help the social performance, and that is actually massive. So how do we do it right the way through is going to be key. Well, a big part of that is going to be use of sensory technologies and analytics as well. We we'll also look outside. A big part of what we're doing as well in terms of this pillars is the whole world of data capture and digital survey. We need to be able to better understand what's already there, and we're seeing different ways. It's not just, I think, in terms of the laser scanning, but much more use of the simple things in terms of photogrammetry, the small handheld cameras as well. And back to that word appropriate within there, but we're, we need to understand more about the existing estate as well. This is a bit of project we're working with uh, in terms of Harriet Watt, uh, Dr. Frederick Bosch. We've got a lot of heritage in Scotland as well. We spent a lot of time in conservation. So you can imagine we capture the laser scan all the, the stonework within there. We're looking at the stonework segmentation. And actually doing this was a time-consuming task normally by a conservationist. And we can now detect, using machine-based algorithms, how many stones, 3,100 stones. We then start to look in terms of the mortar joints for it. You can see them starting to appear within there. And we can start to work out the length. And that was a long, long process. You can see there's 1.44 kilometers within there. We now start to think about the mortar depth. You imagine the manual task of having done that before. But the algorithm is now looking at the depth. You see the heat map coming up within there. And then we start to use that, and this is where the machine learning comes in. And again, this takes a bit of time. We've got to show it the first couple, but it can then find out actually what sort of defects were within there. Is it mechanical damage? Is it peeling as well? So thinking more about how we use our data capture and make sense of our heritage tools as well. This is a slide, it, it looks pretty complex, but it's actually a key thing. It actually shows, as we move towards cities as well, we start to think about BIM for our buildings or smart uh, infrastructure, moving into portfolios, smart cities, and strategies. The more we build together, the more complex it comes. So you see that's capital delivery. We then start to think about moving it into operation and performance. So you see that dependency analytics. Are our assets performing as they should? And you can see there, we talk about how we start to move our data. We're starting to think about our buildings, how the data links with transport, water, power, and ultimately people. So we're starting to think about dependency analytics and actually be able to test and move things up now to a city level as well. And this is where we're going. We're the early days of city information modeling. We're working with especially local authorities now to create that fully integrated semantic model within there, giving users real access to their whole portfolio of data sets within there and understand their properties. You see the live feeds within there coming in, in terms of energy costs, and they can look at all the different feeds that might be from CCTV cameras, look at other rich equipment such as street lighting, bring it together in all one place to try and understand it. I think finally, our commercial models. This is all great, but unless we put new commercial models in there, it's not gonna make much change. So we're spending a lot of time looking at new smart forms of contract that look at servitization, and how data is gonna support them as well. You can imagine we're thinking about more about spaces, products, services that align more and more with customer demand within there as well. So what does that start to look like? I think we'll start to see that uberization of construction as well.
So finally, just to reflect upon some of the things we've said today, what we're saying. Number one is we need to get the basics right without fail. Good information management has got to be key. We talk about things such as classification systems, a common data environment. Meaningful collaboration, we use this term collaboration a lot, but actually, you know, when we have a project, do we actually have a team building event at the beginning of it? What do we do in terms of behaviours to get that right? How do we actually get people around about the model? Only creating data has got purpose. Send some time they're going to really setting it up. Think about the plain language questions, who's going to supply it, and actually how much information is needed. Think beyond delivery as well. Actually think, is it going to improve your service provision? Work with end users. We use soft landings for that one. I think the key thing we mentioned is this need to have the golden thread of security. Think about your security wrapper, look at the vulnerabilities and your plans to ameliorate that one. Big thing as well, new entrants. You know, this is going to need new talent or data scientists within there. What are you doing to attract them? Because others out there are competing for that competition as well. And the big thing you know, today, hopefully it's time for you now to go and create your own corporate strategy and move things on sort of thing. So thank you for listening to our story. I hope you've got a few new ideas for your own. And hopefully we've got time for one or two questions. Thanks, Dave. I, uh, that was uh, the most surprising thing about that is like you've got through your presentation without Liam heckling you. Uh, <laughs> I thought that was going to happen, but uh, no, it's fantastic. Thank you, Dave, for, for coming out and, and presenting today. And uh, are there any questions uh, for Dave at the moment? somebody in Sydney that's asking the question? <laughs> Thanks, Dave. That was a very interesting update of what's going on, uh, particularly in the UK. Um, it's Ilse Cooper, by the way. Um, just uh, a quick question on, hopefully, about... Um, I appreciate there's a lot of data that's about to come. It's like a tidal wave, tsunami, whatever you want to call it. There's actually still a lot of data that currently already exists but um, for some circumstances, that data gets ignored. Um, and a particular circumstance that I'm thinking of is um, uh, the Victorian Auditor General's Office recently published uh, a report on a road agency and um, looked at their maintenance program and highlighted some pretty you know, uh, key factors about what they are and what they're not doing. Um, and one of the key aspects was um, they actually didn't have uh, a strong uh, ethos around data, data collection, or even being able to demonstrate, uh, say, compliance of their own obligations, or being able to demonstrate value for money kind of connotations. If um, that is the circumstance, um, you know, what do you see needs to change in terms of recognising um, the value of data um, and those kind of mechanisms or frameworks that might be required to start holding people account for not recognising that data or not fulfilling their own requirements and duties? Yeah, I, th I think it's a great question. And you're right, I mean, most of the work we're doing now is, is not with new data, it's, re you know, it's retrospective data. And we find, especially local authorities, you know, they've had databases that have actually, you know, we call it homebrew, they've built themselves over the year within there. And one of the big things we find is actually we spend a lot of time doing data audits, looking at data quality. So as you like to say, I think going forward, it would be hugely valuable is actually having data quality frameworks. Also data audits within there. So I think as you're, as you're like to said, actually creating a, a framework around about it. I think the clear things as well is actually having very much allocated roles and responsibilities that are there to curate it as well. And I think that's a big thing. We, you know, as you rightly said, we often talk about creation of data, but curation. So having clear roles and responsibility is who's accountable for it. And actually looking at the design quality or the data quality piece within there. So actually creating frameworks is a great starting point uh, within there as well. Whether you can create anything beyond that in terms of any legality, I don't know at this point in time, but we need to have a better conversation with the legal people round about this as well, with our legal community. And can I ask a question? How many folk here today are from a legal community or a legal background? I don't think there's probably anybody. I think we need to have more players from, uh, I think there's one hand, but we, we actually need to have more of a legal community having this conversation. But creating a design quality framework, I think, would be a great starting point. There was 
one more card. Down the front here. Thanks. You're, you're 20,000 steps in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's, it's Thanks, man. You're getting stepped up again. I am. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, so, Warwick Stennis from Richard Coombs. Um, in Australia, we're starting to see a lot of the tertiary education sectors and big property portfolio uh, owners implement ISO 55000. Uh, what are you seeing in the UK in terms of um, that standard and adoption? Yeah, so, so it's a good point. I mean, you know, the, the 55000 is key. In fact, that's our starting point, if you like, for it. So right at the very top, think of it as a triangle. That, that's our key part. And we've created, we call it PAS 1 to part 3, that underpins it. So using those principles, how do we then start to tie them into, you know, to actually supply data that's going to support organisation requirements, statutory requirements that are set out within there. And that's been a key, key part. However, I think everybody's got focused too much on capital delivery and not thinking about the asset management piece within there. And I think we need to have more conversation with those that manage assets. We often speak to the FM teams more and more, but actually for those that are delivering an asset management strategy, how do we tie that together? The good thing is 2020, we've got the ISO standard coming out, ISO 19650 part three, again, which will underpin it as well. So I think the two of them juxtapose nicely, but we need to spend more time, I think, at the beginning of our projects, understanding what information, what questions do we have to answer that responds to our asset management strategy. So again, we need to have these conversations, we need to have more asset manager players, especially those who do the forward planning within there in room to have these discussions. Any more? There's one more in the middle, and then. David, you talk about ISO and BS standards. So the elephant in the room is, how has Brexit affected uh, BIM mandates in the UK? Well, it's, 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 so, 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 so no, it's a really good question. So num number one is there shouldn't, there should be no change because of Brexit and, and there. Uh, the, the only thing it should, and I don't think it will, is. In the UK, we also use SEN standards, the European standards, but from an ISO point of view, there won't be any change. So Brexit won't affect ISO. There's been quite a few discussions around about that point of view, and we're working still, I think, the standards body with SEN very closely as well to make sure that we align with European standards as well. But you know what? We, we see it as a great opportunity within there. I think, you know, UK standards have been great, but actually now if we can harmonise things internationally, so folk haven't really changed the way we work from... UK to Australia, I think that would really help. But we don't see any change because of Brexit. If there's been some good high-level discussions going on, I just hope Brexit never happens. But uh, mm. is that uh, any, any more? Or maybe one more That's over here. Uh, thanks, David. It's Graham Mackerel from the AMCA. Um, one of your slides uh, on savings indicated a 50% in trade gaps. So we're interested in obviously um, you know, addressing those trade gaps. Can you just expand on y what yeah. was mentioned or referenced by the 50% trade gaps? Y yeah, d d definitely. So, so, I mean, the original idea, I mean, it's back to, you know, one of the reasons wh why would, you know, a government such as the UK actually support something called BIM? And I think actually we're seeing that we're starting to you know, import a lot of skills and services from elsewhere that are cheap. But the big part is actually how do we get better at it and start to export. So number one was how do we export things like BIM services, but actually how do we start to do advanced services in terms of built environment. But it's now going beyond that. And the next part of the program is actually exporting smart products and starting to build, if you like, we talk about design for manufacture, being able to supply, if you like, intelligent kits of parts. So our export is both in terms of skills and start to think about these kits of parts as well. So exploiting your know, UK opportunities around about advanced manufacture and products as well within there. So it's an amalgam of a few things within there, but growing from construction services to intelligent products within there as well. Okay. Maybe one, just time for one more, yeah, thank you. Um, Gus Corey from Dreyfus. Just a quick question. Uh, from a global perspective, um, how 
how much is COBE actually being used? I, I know it's a requirement on a lot of projects here now, but I'm, I'm just wondering whether it's actually being well, well utilised. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a real good question, and I think, you know, if I, go, go back to what we said, I think, can I speak to one of my colleagues, it's probably something I think it, it's never been a story around about it, the wrap around about Kobe has never been great, it's been a very technical conversation, and actually thinking about the value, I don't, well, I'll cut to the point, is it, be, you know, it's not being used as well as it should, I think it's only being used at a very basic level, in terms of, it's generally key el elements of plant that are being there, it's not looking at some of the fields that are, you know, are much more there. Th the bit that is being used for, I think, is really positive, though, is to support early decision making. It might be in terms of areas or such like. So it's supporting a lot of early decisions within there, but we're not getting the full scheme, I would say, yet to get everyone across into our FM model. But it's growing. But interestingly enough, I think when the minute it comes a contractual requirement, there's never been any problem sort of thing. It only comes, I think, when it comes a nice to have and you have a bit of grey area within it, folk will complain about it. But when it's been mandatory within the contract, we use the, the, the protocol in the UK, we've got through it a lot easier within there as well. What I would say is a positive thing is actually when we do have Kobe's requirement, there's a lot better interface with product manufacturers to get these data cells into it. I think the good thing as well, there's much better middleware and there's much better apps around about it to actually get data into you know, products such as Sulebi and that become you know, helping us actually make that journey through. Are we there yet? Probably not. It's probably been the hardest challenge, I'd say, within there. But for me, well, what else is there that's the lowest common denominator lets everybody play? It's also, I think, very good in terms of design, you know, quality checking around about data quality within there as well, and hopefully see mu much more apps. Whether or not it's a long-term solution, I don't know the answer to it yet, but uh, it's still being used, I think, as a lightest touch rather than bringing the whole data set through. And generally, it's just the key maintainable services we're seeing coming through. But I still think there's a great opportunity for Kobe. And I think whatever comes next, we can't lose that data. You know, it's got to be say, actually, we've spent several years now building Kobe. You know, let's continue. But if anything, I think the good thing, it started to get an industry thinking about, you know, master data management within there. I think about a data-centric approach. We look at projects, as we mentioned, you know, Crossrail, a lifespan of 150 years. It, it can't be proprietary. If we get something like Kobe, we think about a better chance of maintaining a data set for 100 years than we have something that's, that's product specific. So we're getting there. I don't think it's perfect, but uh, it's helping everybody play a part. All right, thank you. Thanks, Dave. Uh, we really appreciate you coming out and, and presenting today. I'm sure uh, everybody in the crowd does too. But uh, if you could put your hands together for Dave, thank you. <laughs>